here is a quick example of the focus of today's workshop. Take a minute to look at it and see if there's any that you've experienced before. You may have never heard of the term automatic negative thoughts, but I can guarantee that every single one of you watching this now will have experienced automatic negative thoughts. So in the next 30 minutes, we're going to have a crash course on the following topics. What automatic negative thoughts are and how you can recognize them. How to examine your automatic negative thoughts and how to respond to them in a healthy and biblical way. So what are automatic negative thoughts? In order to really understand, we need to first define just automatic thoughts. Automatic thoughts are our brain's way of processing what's happening and trying to make some sense of it. So when they're just automatic thoughts, it's actually fine and it can actually be helpful. For example, if you're walking alone in a dark alley, an automatic thought that you might have is, this could be a dangerous situation. The feeling would be fear and then the behavior would be the smart one of getting out of that alley. But automatic negative thoughts are the automatic thoughts that are negative in nature. Our automatic negative thoughts don't come from nowhere. They're actually clues to our deeper thoughts and core beliefs about the self, others, the world, and God. They're problematic because they're often so self-defeating, irrational, and they keep you chained to wrong and dangerous beliefs. So virtually everyone has automatic negative thoughts, and we can think of them like a bad habit. It's the default thinking that we resort to automatically, and in that way, it's like a bad habit that's being enforced over and over again. The core beliefs that you have and the automatic negative thoughts that come from it reveal ways of thinking that are not aligned with the message of the gospel that we believe. So I know from personal experiences that when you are unaware of your thoughts, you're completely blind to yourself. For most of my life, I thought that as long as my behaviors were good and right, my thoughts and feelings didn't matter at all. I was actually barely aware of them. But looking back now, my thoughts were often full of bitterness and a series of pervasive automatic negative thoughts went something like this. Things rarely work out for me. I'm the only one I can trust and I need to prove myself. It was the thought that I had when something didn't go exactly my way. It was the thought that I had when someone gave me feedback about something or there was relational tension or conflict. By continuously thinking this thought, I was practicing over and over again the belief that I was all alone in this world. I was practicing cutting people out of my life emotionally when I felt that they had hurt me or lost my trust. This thought was also cooling my view of God, as well as people God had placed in my life, as someone who didn't care about me and was just putting up with me. Jesus says in Mark 7, 20 to 23, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Our thoughts really matter. Through tackling our automatic negative thoughts, we're starting a battle against the deeply seated views and beliefs that are contrary to the gospel. On a given day, each of us experience many, many thoughts. Thoughts about ourselves, thoughts about others, thoughts about the current situation, thoughts about God and this world. So try to notice your thoughts right now. We're not very practiced at noticing or noting our thoughts. In fact, most of our thoughts pass away without us ever consciously noting it. In my study of psychology, we learn about something called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT for short. Through research, CBT has been proven effective for a variety of psychological and physical issues. Things like depression, anxiety, OCD, even severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia and psychosis, as well as chronic pain, insomnia, etc., are proven to be effective with CBT. CBT is actually very simple in its theory. It's the idea that our feelings, behaviors, and our thoughts all affect one another. We know from personal experience that this is true, but let me give you an example from my personal experience. 
It's the same situation of trying something new, but depending on my thoughts, my feelings, and my behaviors are really different. So the situation is this. I try something new and outside of my comfort zone. Surprise, surprise, I'm not very good at it. The automatic thoughts that I might have is, I'm so bad at this. How come everyone else is so good at this? Gosh, everyone must think I'm so lame. I'm never going to be good at this. The feelings that come with automatic negative thoughts like this one are feelings like shame, embarrassment, feeling exposed and stressed. And the behavior is that you're never going to want to try that thing again. But if you have an automatic thoughts that's not so negative, you might just think, ah, that was so bad. I've never done that before, so I guess it makes sense how painful that was. Next time, I hope I'm going to be a little better. The feelings there are just going to be mild embarrassment and maybe even some determination. And the behavior is going to be that you're going to be able to try it again and get better at it. So see how the thoughts affect the feelings and the behaviors? That's the importance of thoughts. But from my experience, the feelings are pretty spontaneous. And we might think that our thoughts are, the spon are spontaneous like this too. They seem subconscious and outside of our control. But actually, thoughts can be more easily tackled than feelings. With practice, we can learn to first differentiate between our feelings and our thoughts and recognize common thinking patterns. And then we can start building new patterns of thoughts. So we're going to learn the three C's to battling our automatic negative thoughts. Catch it, check it, and change it. This is a quick way to remember the basic steps of how to deal with automatic negative thoughts. First, in order to catch the thought, we need to know what automatic negative thoughts look like. I want to introduce the different types of automatic negative thoughts so that you can see that you're probably experiencing a lot more automatic negative thoughts on a daily ba basis than you probably even know. In other words, these are the common thought distortions that people fall into. I'm not going to go through every single one because I've given you a handout. So take a minute to look at it and circle the ones that you feel like you're most prone to and you can follow along as we go through them. So mind reading is when you assume that you know what other people are thinking when you don't have any evidence. For example, if your professor is not being very friendly, you automatically think, he must think I shouldn't be in this class. Fortune telling is when you predict the future and conclude that that's how things will turn out. For example, coming into a retreat like this one, you might have the automatic negative thought that you're not going to learn anything new. Catastrophizing is overestimating the chances of disaster. This is when you expect something unbearable or intolerable to happen, and you believe that what's happened or what will happen will be so awful that you won't be able to stand it. For example, a thought might be, it would be terrible and it would be the end of my life if I failed. Labeling is assigning global negative traits to yourself and other people. For example, thinking, I'm just an undesirable person, or he's such a rotten roommate. Discounting positives is when the claim that um, positive things that you or others do are trivial. So this is when you think that that's just what friends are supposed to do, so it doesn't count when she's nice to me. Overgeneralizing is when you assume a global pattern of negative on the basis of a single incident. If it's happened once, it's likely always going to happen that way. A classic example of this is when you believe that you can't trust anyone because there was that one friend who betrayed you in the past. 
Negative filtering is when you ignore all the positive things and only choose to look at the negative things. For example, only thinking about the times that your roommate hasn't done their chores and forgetting about all the times that they've helped you with yours. Dichotomous thinking is thinking in very black and white terms. For example, things are all right or all wrong, all good or all bad. It's a tendency to view things at extremes with no middle ground. You view events or people in all or nothing terms. You might think, I get rejected by everyone, or it was a complete waste of time. Shoulds are another one, and this is when you use should, ought, must language to set up unrealistic unreal expectations for yourself or others. It makes you become more rigid, and you interpret events in terms of how things should be, rather than simply focusing on what is. I should do well. If I don't, then I'm a failure. Personalizing is when you take responsibility for something that's not your fault. Um, you think that what people say or do is always some kind of reaction to you or some way related to you. You attribute a disproportionate amount of blame to yourself for negative events and you fail to see that certain events are also caused by others. An example of this might be, my friend left our friend group because I was such a bad friend. Blaming is when you focus on the other person as a source of all of your negative feelings and refuse to take responsibility for changing yourself. She's to blame for the way I feel now, or my parents are the root of all of my problems. Regret orientation is the idea that you could have done better in the past instead of focusing on what you could do better now. Emotional reasoning is when you make generalizations that are based entirely on your feeling, and in other words, what you feel becomes your reality. For example, you think, I feel hurt, so that must mean my mentor is a mean person. Judgment focus is when you view self and others and events in terms of good or bad, superior or inferior, rather than simply just describing or accepting. You're continually measuring yourself and others according to some sort of standard and finding that you fall short. Focusing on your judgments as well as judgments of other people. You might think, if I take up tennis, I won't do well. Or you might think, look how successful she is. I'm never going to be that successful. So one quick trick to see if your thoughts are automatic negative thoughts are using absolute words. There are words like always, never, any, everybody, all the time. But actually, these words generally don't reflect reality. We say things like, I'm never invited to things without thinking much about it. But it's probably not true that you're never invited to things. So these words are a really simple way to recognize that your thoughts might be a little bit distorted. So catching a thought consists of two steps. First, you need to write down the thought. Then you figure out which category of automatic negative thoughts your thought falls into. We'll call this labeling the thought. Also, for those of you not so practiced at recognizing your thoughts, you might be wondering, how do I know when I need to catch a thought? This is where your feelings will really come in handy. When you're feeling unpleasant emotions, emotions like anger, sadness, bitterness, this is a sign that you need to think about your thoughts. So we need to break this cycle. In order to do this, we're going to examine the evidence for and against that thought. Is this really a true thought? What does the evidence prove? So how do we do this? First, we need to think of the evidence that your negative thought may be true. This will likely be very easy because it's what your brain has been practicing for all of its life. An example of this might be with the negative thought, no one likes me. Some evidence for this thought might be, my friends didn't invite me to hang out with them. My mentor gave me some negative feedback. My coworkers never talked to me and the cashier at the store was unfriendly. Next, you're going to write the evidence that your negative thought may not be true. This one's likely going to be a lot more difficult. Your brain might resist it and find ways to fight the evidence. But for now, just write it down, even if you can't believe it. Some questions that will help you gather evidence against your negative thoughts are on handout two. Because your brain is so practiced at jumping to your negative thoughts automatically, we need to practice new thoughts, even if it's not automatic. We're just starting, so it'll take a longer time of reflection initially to come up with this evidence. I want to share with you some practical tips to help with checking the thought. 
we need to make checking the thought and thinking about our negative thoughts, labeling them correctly, and producing evidence a regular habit. If we're going to do the difficult work of breaking through the bad habit of our automatic negative thoughts, we need to make fighting against it a habit too. One way you can get this is by getting a fresh perspective. Because sometimes you just can't get out of your thoughts. Your mind goes completely blank when you try to think of evidence against your negative thoughts or try to think of alternate thoughts. Or you think of them, but they're not very convincing coming from you. This is when you really need to talk to others. Tell your trusted friends or your mentors about your negative thoughts. Chances are, even if they've never taken this workshop or have never even heard of automatic negative thoughts, they'll naturally go through the questions and the steps that we've been talking about. This is also where you'll need to be careful of people who automatically verify all of your automatic negative thoughts without even getting all of the facts straight. So after doing this, we're going to practice coming up with an alternate thought using the evidence that we've generated, even if it's just slightly altered. Here the goal is not to make huge changes to our negative thoughts. We're going to take it one step at a time. Make the alternate thoughts ones that can be believable to you. So for example, the thought that I fail at everything might just become, well, there was that one time that I didn't fail. Or the thought that everyone noticed my mistakes and thinks I'm lame can maybe become, maybe everyone did notice my mistake, but maybe not everyone thinks that I'm lame. So I want to go through an example of what we've all learned so far. You can turn to handout three. It's going to have a chart that looks like this slide here. Let's go through a hypothetical situation together. Sam texts Taylor, a new friend from a student group, asking if they want to study together. But it's been more than four hours since Sam texted and there's still no response. The automatic negative thought that Sam has is this. It's impossible to make friends in college and I'm not going to be able to make any friends in college. So let's go through the steps together. You've probably noticed that we've already caught the thought together. But if you were Sam, you would know that you should go through these steps by some of the emotions that you're feeling right now. Emotions like feeling really nervous, self-conscious, frustrated. Or you might even know from your odd behavior of checking your phone every two minutes and maybe even hearing some phantom vibrations. So that's the thought, and we've already gone through the first step of catching it. Part of catching it is also needing to label the thought. From the list, which thinking traps is Sam falling into? He's definitely falling into some fortune telling as well as possibly some overgeneralization. So now let's go through the step of checking it together. So first, what's the evidence that Sam's thoughts might be true? I'll give you 30 seconds to jot down some answers. Some things that I thought of were some of the following thoughts. It's been pretty tough to make friends in class. I'm already a month into college and I haven't been able to make a good friend yet. It's true that I don't have as many friends as I thought I would when I first started college. And my other friends already all seem to have their best friends. Next, let's think about the evidence that Sam's thoughts might not be true. I'll give you another 30 seconds. little more time together on this one. I want to try going through all of the questions or some of the questions together. So we already know that Sam has fallen into some of the negative thinking traps. He's thinking, I'm not going to make any friends in college and his fortune telling. 
Are there any other possible explanations for this situation? Yes, Sam might not have the full picture. First, Taylor could be working. It's also true that only four hours have passed, which is how long some classes or labs are. Also, the full picture is that Taylor is not Sam's only chance to make a friend. Is this thought helpful? No. Maybe it's hard for Sam to make friends, but by holding on to this negative thought, Sam's going to be even more discouraged in making friends. How would someone else think if they were in this situation? You know, they probably wouldn't be so worried. And in fact, Sam doesn't think twice when friends from high school don't text him back right away. So what are some alternate thoughts that Sam could generate in this situation? Sam could think, maybe Taylor hasn't answered my text because of class or work. The fact that I haven't gotten a resp response back doesn't mean that I won't be able to make any friends. Taylor hasn't responded back, but there are other settings that I could still make friends in college. So we've been living for years and years, for most of our conscious lives, with some of the automatic negative thoughts that we, we talked about today. These are likely to be very deeply ingrained in our minds and our hearts. But now that we have a new identity and skills to be able to recognize our own automatic negative thoughts, we need to have automatic positive or automatic gospel thoughts to turn to. This is where Bible memorization or just knowing your Bible becomes really powerful. This is going to be your weapon against your own automatic negative thoughts and Satan to actively fight the automatic negative thoughts. Because so many of the automatic negative thoughts we have are about our identity, being worthless, helpless, unlovable, we need verses that tell us exactly who we are. So here I've given you some verses about our identity in Christ. So today, we spent time thinking about our automatic negative thoughts and learning how to deal with them. I just want to take this moment to encourage you that this is not something you master in 30 minutes. So just start by noticing what you're thinking. You're catching the thought. Are a lot of the thoughts that you're having negative? Now you can see if you're falling into any of the thought categories and try to look at the evidence for and against your thought. You're checking the thought. Now using this evidence and other tools like getting a fresh perspective from trusted people, you can start to change your thoughts. Once you make this a regular practice, you'll be surprised at how much you learn about yourself. It's my prayer that as many of you grow in this practice, you will no longer be controlled and thrown about by your automatic negative thoughts, but instead be grounded in the gospel truths that I hope can one day become your automatic positive thoughts instead. So to end, I'm going to give you two verses that I hope will encourage you in this endeavor. The first one is Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, 
think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The second verse is 2 Corinthians 10.5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Thank you.